the Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network presents The Roots of Reconstruction by Rusas John Rushduni Narrated by Shelby Luke Thank you for joining me this week in the reading of Roots of Reconstruction by Russus John Rushduni. In lieu of the judgment of God across this nation, I appeal to you to listen, learn, and live as the Holy Spirit guides you in the truth of the Word of God. The words and prompting of fallible men do not hold a candle to the truth of Scripture, and the truth of Scripture will only be words to our ears unless we exhort, establish, and exercise these infallible words in every area of thought and life. Calcedon Report Number 108, August 1974 A partial definition of history is that it is the remembered past, whereas heredity is genetic, history is cultural, religious, and emotional. Its roots are in memory, meanings, and faith. A Tatar child adopted at birth by an English family will show Tatar features, but his history will be English. History thus is a roadblock to those who wish to remake man. Historical memories and meanings are not rational. In example, they are not products of logical thought, but of acts of good and bad faiths. Hence it is that in the age of statism, educators and political theorists have been hostile to history and have replaced it with, quote, the social sciences, unquote, whose purpose is to study the control of man by man. Not surprisingly, some thinkers have dreamed of some means of electroshock, quote, therapy, unquote, to destroy history and the individual. More practically, modern education has dedicated itself to the clean slate theory of the mind. The child can be best educated if his mind is swept free of the influences of home, church, community, nation, and faith. As a result, status education is anti-historical and alienates children and youth from their past, from root. The goal is to produce a rootless person who will then see issues in terms of science and reason. Existentialism and pragmatism have been logical philosophies in terms of this trend, in that they require separation from all past influences and history and see freedom as a conditioning in which man is determined solely by the biology of his being without reference to the complex of history. The demand is for rootlessness as freedom. As a result, roots are seen as slavery. As a university student, I recall how professors regularly denied value to any pro-Southern points of view in historical research, making it the butt of jokes and concluding with the remark, quote, they're still fighting the Civil War, unquote. Any anti-communist books or articles by refugee scholars were similarly discounted. These men were involved and had historical memories. All primary sources thus, while basic to research, had to be treated with a radical suspicion. Clearly, it is true that involvement in history can lead to distortions. I recall vividly an old Paiute Indian talking about the Paddy Cap War, so, quote, minor, that many specialists in Western American history are unaware of it, unquote as though world history had to be understood in terms of it. For him, it had to be. I have had the same experience with Central Europeans, Near Easterners, Bosques, and others. I have heard scholars dismiss such historical memories as, quote, living in the past, unquote. Some people do live in the past too much. Some live only for the moment. And some, most foolish of all, think they live only by reason. The fact is that peoples with long memories have long lives, as witnessed the Jews, Armenians, and others. Basic to that long memory is a hard core of faith. Moreover, justice and memory have a necessary relationship. Men to whom past evils are nothing 
and present rational considerations everything will do evil to eliminate the present non-rational problems. For the social scientist, the non-scientific and the non-rational are virtually identical with evil. After World Wars I and II, the peace treaties realigned the world in terms of political status considerations and ensured injustice and war. Had they been more scientific, the evil would have been greater because history would have been even more flagrantly denied. Such a destructive course would logically follow from the premises inherent in the modern perspective. For Karl Popper, for example, in The Open Society and Its Enemies, quote, history has no meaning, unquote. There are interpretations of history, and they vary from group to group. But history as such has no objective meaning. There is no predestinating God to give an established meaning to history. Only man can do that. For Popper, quote, although history has no meaning, we can give it a meaning, unquote. This is the key to humanism in the age of the state. God's meaning is denied, and the meaning of the scientific planners is progressively asserted. This requires the denial of God's history and the suppression of historical memory, so that a new history, a social science, can be created. As a result, the modern state is progressively perverse to anyone with an historical and Christian perspective. It denies Gresham's law, and it denies the faith and tradition of peoples. These are all irrelevant considerations to scientific reason. The meaning of history as created by such thinkers, is known only to them because they, quote, give it a meaning, unquote. State schools and massive brainwashing are necessary to convince the people of this meaning. God's meaning, however, is known to all men, although they suppress it in unrighteousness, Romans 1, 17 through 21. It is the meaning in terms of which we were created and apart from which our lives disintegrate into meaninglessness. The more nearly the age of the state comes to realizing its meaning, the more radical the revolt against it grows. Men are not yet turning in great numbers to Christian faith, but they are turning against the bankrupt modern establishment. It has bred emptiness, not meaning. The experience of nothingness rather than faith, its new order is turning out to be death. Galcedon Report number 109, September 1974. According to Norman Zakur, in an introduction to medieval institutions, quote, the idea that where there is no justice there is no authority was firmly entrenched in feudalism, unquote. Thus, despite the common violations of law, there was a principle of justice in terms of which judgment and progress were possible. With Niccolo Machiavelli and then Thomas Hobbes, a new idea began to develop, one which John P. Roach in Courts and Rights summed up as holding in effect that, quote, law is the command of the sovereign, unquote. Whether the sovereign be the ruler, parliament, or later, the people. For some time, these two ideas, however contradictory, coexisted. Rulers and people were, in varying degrees, Christian. They believed in common ideas of right and wrong, and they were agreed as to what justice means. As a result, the sovereign's law was still a large degree tied to an essentially biblical framework. This framework was entirely subject at first to the ruler's choice. The people were Lutheran, Catholic, Episcopal, or Reformed in terms of the ruler's choice. His word was law, and his religious preference was the people's church, and no other legal choice was possible. The result was the development of civic religion, a religious foundation for a purely national state or for the ruler's state. The god of the state was the ruler's choice and the ruler's supposed ally. The belief of the rulers was that God should be grateful to the king for keeping the realm in the camp of the church, whatever the true church was held by the king to be. Thus in 1706, after the defeat of the Battle of Romilies, Louis XIV said, quote, God seems to have forgotten all I have done for him. Unquote. 
As time passed, however, this civic religion became less and less concerned with theology and church and more and more concerned with maintaining the bare bones of biblical morality. A nation was held to be God-fearing if it had an occasional prayer and Bible reading at official and educational functions and vaguely upheld a minimal view of the Ten Commandments and a few other things. Even this minimal civic religion declined to the point where the regents of New York composed, as Roche noted, quote, a nonpartisan prayer essentially addressed to whom it may concern for daily recitation in the public schools, unquote. Then this prayer was invalidated in 1962. Since then, civic religion has become even broader. In 1965, unbelievers who were pacifist gained the right to affirm and maintain with civil sanctions a totally private religion as the basis of their morality. Meanwhile, the old feudal idea that where there is no justice, there is no authority was revived in terms of Thoreau and Bakunin to give a moral basis to civil disobedience. A key problem of the modern era was thus brought into sharp focus. The foundations of all law are in essence religious and theological. They are questions of ultimacy and moral necessity. Law without faith is an impossibility. Every law order is a moral and a theological order, a structuring of society in terms of a fundamental faith. If the faith dies, the law order dies also. Earlier centuries had insisted erroneously on identifying faith and the church, limiting the faith to a particular form of the church. Later, the faith was identified with the state, and now with the purely personal taste of the individual for whom the faith is existential, not something beyond man, but totally of man. The consequences of all three positions have been destructive of social order and of Christian faith. To make either the church, the state, or the individual the voice of God is to limit God and absolutize the human order. The old pagan Roman maxim was, quote, What pleases the prince has the force of law, unquote. To reduce the law to an institution or person is destructive of law, and that law, then, is tyranny. If ultimate law comes from man, or an agency or institution of men, then I have no appeal against its arbitrariness except my personal dislike and dissent. I have no religious or moral stand against the law. If I have an appeal to supernatural and ultimate law against all that men may do, then I have a basis for resistance and for reconstruction. Because relativism has so long prevailed, men no longer affirm as a society any faith in an absolute right and wrong. The result is an erosion of the idea of the rule of law and the normality now of the rule of political pressure. Kant reduced the law to a humanistic moral imperative. Quote, Every formula which expressed the necessity of an action is called a law. Unquote. But where is necessity in the modern point of view? It was clearly formulated in the 1960s by the hippies thus, quote, Do your own thing. Unquote. Necessity is no longer cosmic. It is no longer a part of the essence or nature of reality. It is entirely personal and anarchistic. The result is a breakdown of the very idea of law. Increasingly, there is neither justice nor authority. When such a situation prevails, darkness settles in because there is no light of justice to illuminate society and to give authority. The psalmist words stand confirmed. Quote, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh, but in vain. Unquote. Psalms 127, 1. Chalcedon Report number 110, October 1974. One reason why man has rarely been free in his long history is his fear and hatred of freedom. Over and over again, men have paid lip service to freedom while constructing instead social orders which allow no room for freedom. Historically, one of the major functions of the state has been to protect man and society from the dangers of freedom. 
In the ancient world, stateless man was regarded as worse off than the dead. Egyptians, Sumerians, Babylonians, and others regarded the state as the true life of man. The Greeks, who despite modern mythology, had no love of freedom, defined man as a political animal. Man could not be truly man apart from the state. Plato's Republic is a blueprint for totalitarian communism and Aristotle's politics saw man as the property of the state. Aristotle espoused state control of education because, quote, the citizen should be molded to suit the form of government under which he lives, unquote. Moreover, quote, neither must we suppose that any one of the citizens belongs to himself, for they all belong to the state and are each of them a part of the state, unquote. Politics, Book 8, Chapter 1. He held also that, quote, the state is by nature clearly prior to the family and to the individual, since the whole is of necessity prior to the parts, unquote. Book 1, Chapter 2. For most of history, this pagan view of the state has governed men. Men have found freedom to be a threat, and they have readily turned over their lives to the claims of the state. But this is not all. Salvation has been defined in terms of the state, and the state seen as man's savior. For the Romans, salvation was security under Caesar. According to the archaeologist Sir William M. Ramsey, quote, the paternal government was salvation, unquote. For those who live on imperial estates, Ramsey concluded, Quote, the salvation of Jesus and Paul was freedom. The salvation of the imperial system was serfdom. Unquote. Sir W. M. Ramsey, The Bearing of Recent Discovery on the Trustworthiness of the New Testament, page 197F, London, Hodder and Stroughton, 1920. This faith in salvation by the state was basic to the Renaissance and is essential to an understanding of modern man except for the partial but profound counter-movement of early American developments, especially between 1750 and 1850, the basic belief of modern man is that the good life and salvation can only be attained by means of the state. This means increasing state powers, because in order to save man, the state must be stronger. Thus, the more serious man's plight the more the state must increase its power in order to save men. The biblical doctrine of salvation holds that because the triune God is the sovereign and omnipotent Lord, salvation is possible. Only a sovereign God can save because He alone determines all things, and He alone cannot be overthrown in all His ways. Man's salvation is only assured where his Savior is omnipotent, and his salvation cannot be annulled or overruled by any other force. Man, in relation to God, cannot have a primary freedom. Man has only a secondary freedom, the freedom of a creature to be what God has ordained him to be. Quite logically, the salvation of the state mimics this pattern. In order to give man an assured salvation, one which cannot be set aside, the state must set aside man's freedom and work towards its own omnipotence. The state must be sovereign, and it must be beyond challenge. Man must be simply what the state ordains him to be, and nothing more. For the state to plan or predestinate man's salvation requires totalitarian powers for the state, and this the state constantly aspires to gain. In this quest, the state has the active support of modern man. Having turned away from the triune God, he looks religiously to the modern state for salvation, for wound to tomb security, and for the fatherhood he once attributed to God. Thus, although at times the modern state has gained its powers by legal usurpation, it has generally been with the active or passive consent of the people. Man, said Jesus Christ, is by virtue of the fall a slave, a slave to sin, and therefore partial to slavery, until he makes man free by his grace. John eight thirty three through 36 Modern man has still enough of the trappings of his religious and cultural past. 
so that he feels that lip service must be paid to freedom. He honors it at every turn, and every day works to diminish it. The one assured fact today about any convening legislative body is that it sits, not to increase man's freedom, but to limit it. Freedom to slaves is a dangerous thing, and in the heart of his being modern man is a slave. He has converted church, state, and school into schools for slavery. He has waged war against the threat of freedom at every turn in order to assure the free flow of status salvation. Men who are by nature slaves will only tolerate slavery, and as a result, freedom is under fire and on the wane. The battleground is not the state. The state is the echo chamber, reflecting man's real desires. The problem is in the minds and hearts of men. Quote, if the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Unquote. John 8, 36. There is no other way. Thank you for joining me this week in the reading of Roots of Reconstruction by Bruce's John Rushman. Lord willing, we will be reading again next week. Until then, may God bless your endeavors as you serve the one and only King Jesus. It was the blood of Jesus, the perfect sacrifice, the love he had shown us by his pain, the very prize. It was there at Calvary's tree, where he died for you and me. The Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network brings to you a complete lineup of podcasts where you will hear practical and tactical theology. 
Our desire is not simply that you consume our shows, but that you also live out your faith in every area of life. We can talk all day long about these things, but if we fail to put them into practice, then we fail as ambassadors of Jesus Christ, our King. Subscribe now to your favorite Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network shows, or you can subscribe to the Reconstructionist Radio Master Feed, where all of the content we produce, including the audiobooks and audio articles, will pop up as soon as they are available. And don't forget to visit reconstructionistradio.com to volunteer as a narrator or to partner with this ministry financially. May the Holy Spirit stir you into action for Christ and His kingdom.